Now, an occasion like this provides the opportunity to reflect on where we've come from and where we're going. And I want to take that opportunity both personally and professionally with regard to my field, biogeochemistry and global change. As the uh, video that introduced me illustrates, I was born in Hawaii in 1949 to parents who had uh, met on a student trip to Japan in the summer of 1940. Both of my parents were lawyers who studied at Stanford University, and it was at that time unusual for a woman to have a degree in law, so I was always dealing with exceptional women in my life. We lived in the rainforest above Honolulu, and I spent many hours wandering the trails that surrounded my house there, playing games with friends, but also uh, appreciating the nature that surrounded us. Hawaii at that time was a really interesting place culturally. It was dominated economically by the United States, of which it was not yet a state, and it was dominated also economically by a Caucasian minority within the state. But by the time Hawaii became a state of the United States in 1959, when I was 10 years old, it was dominated politically by the largest group, ethnic group in Hawaii, Japanese and their allies. And at the same time, the native Hawaiian population of Hawaii, which was then at a low ebb in terms of uh, political and uh, power and influence, which from which it has since recovered substantially, still shaped the land to a very substantial extent. The place names were all Hawaiian. The stories we learned in school were all Hawaiian. We recognized ourselves as drawing from the culture of the native Hawaiian people very strongly. Other cultures, Chinese, Philippine, others, <clears throat> also made meaningful contributions. It was just what I knew growing up. But I later recognized when I spent time on the mainland United States uh, that this powerful Asian and indigenous Hawaiian influence made Hawaii a very different place from the mainland states in the US. Now, as a child, I was interested in the world and read voraciously, but I spent my time hiking and body surfing in preference to studying less interesting, interesting subjects. And my grades always displayed my very uneven interest in my, in my subjects. My parents, as my mother will tell you, encouraged me to do better with mixed success. Um, although when I attended a boarding high school on the island of Hawaii, I did learn that generally it was better to actually do the work instead of spending extended and usually unsuccessful efforts trying to avoid doing the work. So that was, a, that was a useful lesson. When not studying or competing in athletics at school, I escaped by hiking into the rainforest above the school, which is illustrated here. And this is an area where I now maintain a long-term research site and, and enjoy going back to very frequently. I left Hawaii to attend college in Massachusetts in 1967 sure that shortly I would return to Hawaii to live, which is something that has not yet happened. Uh, I was fortunate to go to a small liberal arts college, Amherst College in Massachusetts, which required that students take several courses in humanities, in social sciences, and in natural sciences. And I enjoyed the, the courses and discussions with my fellow students very much but I, I didn't really have a direction. Um, I appreciated the biology courses I took, but I never really thought about becoming a biologist, perhaps because most of the people studying biology in my school intended to become medical doctors, and I, I didn't intend to do that. I majored in political science in college, driven by an interest in politics and a vague thought that perhaps I could become a lawyer with that sort of training, as both of my parents were. After all, they were both lawyers. They both had very interesting lives. And indeed, my younger brother is a lawyer, and he leads a very interesting life. But I was aware that political science and the law didn't really fit me. 
and that I was enjoying learning and social life and athletics, but that I didn't really know where I was going. My third year in college, I was fortunate enough to take a course in the literature of science, which I was required to take as a, as a third humanities course. And in that book, read, in that course, read the book, The Ecology of the Invasions by Animals and Plants, by the British ecologist Charles Elton. We read it as literature. We read this book as a, as a work of literature. But it was the subject, more than the writing, that captivated me. Elton wrote of phenomena that I'd observed in Hawaii, the displacement of Hawaiian species by introduced plants and animals from around the world. And he wrote about it with a scientific rigor and a passion to make the world a less homogeneous place. That fit. That was what I'd been looking for. And I went back to the biology department, met the ecologist there, and started to take courses in ecology along with all of the physics and chemistry that I could cram in prior to graduation. The next year was my final year as an undergraduate, and I experienced another piece of remarkable good luck in that the biology department hired a new young ecologist, Stuart Fisher, who was active in the field of ecosystem ecology. I took his course and did research in his laboratory and found that this approach, which focuses on the flows of energy and materials um, in whole ecosystems, made a great deal of sense to me. Not only did it provide a currency for evaluating interactions between plants and animals, soils and water, it also represents a useful way to examine how human activities interact with forces in the natural world. I finished my degree in political science and at the same time thought, sought PhD programs that would be willing to admit me despite my weak and brief background in the subject. Again, I was very fortunate in that Dartmouth College was willing to take a chance on me. And I studied biogeochemistry there with William Reiners, developing a thesis on the interaction between atmospheric and geological processes as they shaped streamwater chemistry in, in the uh, forests of New England in interaction with human-caused acid rain and human changes in land use. After completing my PhD in 1975, I taught at Indiana University, where I had the greatest good fortune of all in meeting my partner, Pamela Matson, shown here a few years later, standing in front of a, a volcano in Hawaii. And I also taught at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill before moving to Stanford University in 1984, where I've been since. That's enough chronology. Looking back, it's easy for me to see that good fortune has played a tremendous role in shaping my path, my career, my research interests, and indeed the way my life's been lived. And I think that's true for many of us as well, to an extent we perhaps try to design out, but never really succeed in doing. Above all, I think I was fortunate to grow up in a system that did not seek to channel students into careers at a very early age but gave the flexibility for exploration, for trying things out, for continuing to try until, at least for me, I found something that fit extremely well. I think students develop at different rates and find their paths at different times, and that we should be careful not to create systems that exclude the possibility of that exploration by putting people into a narrow path at a very early age. Certainly, I try to keep this in mind in my selection of my own graduate students. And as a result, I've been rewarded with the opportunity to work with some outstanding young scientists who come from very diverse academic backgrounds. Now I want to change my focus to talk about biogeochemistry, my field of research interest, what it is, where my research is focused within it, and how I believe and hope the field will change in coming decades. Biogeochemistry is the science that evaluates the cycles of elements, looking at how biological, chemical, geological, and even anthropological practices interact in ways that shape how element cycles, the interactions among their cycles, and how the dynamics of element cycling influence organisms, including us. 
Biogeochemistry involves fundamental research on many scales, from that uh, involving whole ecosystems to that focused on the dynamics of particular microbial populations and their chemical, the chemical processes that they carry out. I, I contribute to this fundamental research. Um, I use the Hawaiian Islands as a model system to understand basic aspects of how biogeochemical systems function. So while my talk will focus on human alterations to the biogeochemical cycles, which I contribute to, it should be recognized that our ability to understand human-caused changes in those cycles and to manage ecosystems in ways that reduces the impact of our changes depends on our fundamental understanding of biogeochemistry. I see no contradiction between pursuing fundamental work and at the same time managing human impacts. Indeed, often the same research can serve multiple purposes. In terms of human impacts on biogeochemical cycles, I think most educated people have had some awareness of one important biogeochemical cycle, that of carbon, at least since the Kyoto meeting in 1997. Human alterations of the carbon cycle, now mostly driven by the combustion of fossil fuels, have raised the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, shown here as it's increased year after year of measurements that began in 1957 and continue through the present. These have raised concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by about 40% um, since the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution. And in turn, that well-documented human-caused increase in carbon dioxide has um, begun to change our climate detectably and will do, do so increasingly in the coming decades. It demonstrably acidifies the surface ocean as this carbon dioxide dissolves in the surface ocean and that will make it increasingly difficult for the many organisms that build their structures out of calcium carbonate, like corals, to <clears throat> survive and grow as the uh, surface ocean becomes increasingly acidic. It increases rates of photosynthesis and alters the tissue chemistry of most terrestrial plants and thereby alters their interactions with animals and with the microbes that consume or decompose them. So in that sense, it fundamentally alters how the world works. I think the educated public is less aware that we've changed the cycle, global cycles of other elements, most notably nitrogen and phosphorus, to a much greater extent than we've altered the cycle of carbon, and that it, those alterations, too, have pervasive influences on the functioning of Earth as a system. Moreover, while the largest change to the carbon cycle comes about from the use of fossil energy, the largest changes in nitrogen and phosphorus are driven by our agricultural systems. Through our activities, we fix nitrogen, that is, take it from the form of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, where most organisms can't use it, and convert it, combine it to, uh, with carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen into forms that most organisms can use, um, massive quantities of nitrogen. The amount brought into circulation this way is compared with natural processes in this slide, our natural fixation biologically on land, we believe, is 70 to 100 million tons a year. Uh, lightning fixes a little bit more for a total of oh, 75 to 105. In contrast, the um, human-caused changes for nitrogen fertilizer, for crops, fossil fuel fi fixation, and other industrial uses of nitrogen sum up to about 175 million tons, significantly more than all of the naturally fixed nitrogen globally. <clears throat> Similarly, more phosphorus is mined from phosphorus-rich ores and used as fertilizer and to a lesser extent in domestic and industrial processes than is mobilized from rocks naturally in the entire Earth. Moreover, these changes are remarkably recent in occurrence more than half of all of the industrial nitrogen fertilizer that's been fixed and applied in all of human history has been applied since 1990. Now, these human alterations to the biogeochemical cycles 
are not inherently a bad thing. Indeed, the ability of our species to produce and mobilize nutrient elements like nitrogen and phosphorus has been an essential component of the enhanced agricultural production that has fed our greatly expanded human population, has kept us ahead in the food production population race. The world would be a much less pleasant and progressive place if we could not supply the nutrients demanded by intensive agriculture. At the same time, the consequences and side effects of our purposeful alterations to Earth's element cycles have been substantial. The use of nitrogen and phosphorus in agriculture is inefficient, whether they're added by or organic amendments in organic fertilizers or by industrial fertilizers. And a large and variable fraction of the nutrients applied to agricultural systems are lost to the environment without ever contributing directly to crop production. Nitrogen is particularly mobile and by multiple pathways. Um, this slide shows the quantities of nitrogen gases, the greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, the uh, gas that drives air pollution, nitric oxides, or NOx, and uh, uh, the gas ammonia that transfers nitrogen from agriculture downwind. The bars on the left in each case show the natural sources globally. The bars on the right show the human-caused sources and the fraction of them that are contributed by agriculture. And you can see in terms of the reactive chemistry of the atmosphere, humans are an overwhelmingly dominant force. Um, in terms of, of these nitrogen-containing gases that affect climate and air quality um, very substantially. <clears throat> when these enhanced levels of nitrogen are deposited downwind, they cause the eutrophication or over-enrichment of downwind ecosystems, and similarly losses of these nutrients through water to lakes, streams, and the coastal ocean causes eutrophication in those systems. You know, we tend to think of biological production as a good thing. The more production, the better in some sense. But if production's a good thing, eutrophication represents too much of a good thing. It can change a clear blue mountain lake into a frothy green pond scum. Productive, to be sure, but a degradation of the environment from the perspective of the original inhabitants of the lake, as well as from the perspective of human values. Eutrophication resulting from alterations to element cycles is widespread. In estuaries and coastal oceans, its effects are expressed in algal blooms, um, many involving harmful species, and in the development of low oxygen areas, where are often referred to as dead zones, the most famous of which is this one at the mouth of the Mississippi River in the southern US. And this shows a trail of very low oxygen water that results from nitrogen, particularly coming down the Mississippi River, mixing into the coastal ocean, stimulating algal blooms that when they sink and die, use up all the oxygen in the water and change, of course, the biological as well as chemical uh, dynamics of those communities profoundly. And these dead zones are a very widespread feature across Earth's coastal oceans, resulting from human alteration of land systems. <clears throat> In terrestrial systems of the temperate zone, eutrophication is often caused by nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere on downwind ecosystems. And these data here show a case where if you add nitrogen to a number of different fields at a number of different levels, here each bar represents the addition of more nitrogen, each group of bars represents a different system, you can see adding nitrogen stimulates the production of plant biomass, but vastly reduces the diversity. And that effect of eutrophication on biological diversity, especially by favoring grasses, over other species is extremely widespread in Earth's uh, temperate zones. <clears throat> Our efforts to control eutrophication 
have met with mixed success. It's easy to state the main challenge. We know that additions of nitrogen and phosphorus are essential for intensive agriculture. What can we do to sustain, even enhance, the productivity on which human society depends, while at the same time reducing the environmental damage that losses of those nutrients can, can um, cause, and not incidentally, saving billions of dollars in fertilizer costs that never lead to increases in production. So one question with that is, where are there opportunities to adjust fertilizer practices to maintain or even enhance the yields of crops while sparing the environment? To answer that question, we need to evaluate how nutrient inputs to agriculture and their environmental costs vary across the surface of the earth. And with a large group of colleagues from multiple disciplines and multiple countries, I evaluated that uh, nutrient balanced in maize-based cropping systems in three regions. Just intensive maize systems in western Kenya, maize wheat double cropping systems in the North China Plain, and maize soybean crop rotations in the upper Midwest United States that were selected to um, illustrate different cropping regimes and different points along the developmental trajectory of intensive agricultural systems. The maize systems of um, western Kenya are really interesting but also fairly sad. This shows um, maize yield of about two tons per hectare, 2,000 kilograms per hectare. Fertilizer nitrogen inputs of seven kilograms per hectare, eight of phosphorus, a removal of nitrogen in harvested products of 59 kilograms per hectare, with a net loss from the soils of a little over 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So with the quantity of nitrogen removed from the fields being greater than nitrogen additions, uh, you drive a system in which agricultural yields will be low and in which intensive agricultural production can be sustained at all for a while only by drawing down the capital of nutrients in what were once very rich and fertile systems, but no longer are. The human costs of these low input, because there's no fertilizer going in, low yield systems are clear in the malnutrition and food insecurity that is endemic in much of sub-Saharan Africa. The environmental costs are serious as well in that low production from what should be fertile soils entrains the conversion of marginal lands to agricultural production with all of the intended, attendant costs in land degradation and ultimately human uh, malnutrition and other challenges. The situation in the uh, intensive maize systems of the North China Plain is very different. In a successful effort to escape chronic food insecurity, China has invested enormously in fertilizer, modern crop varieties, and other inputs to intensive agriculture. They now have the highest rates of fertilizer application per hectare, not per capita, in the world and the largest quantities of nitrogen and phosphorus used of any major world region. This shows the change in nitrogen use by region over the last approximately 50 years. It's gone up in the world, stabilized in the European Union, gone up slightly in the US, and gone up enormously in China over that, over that same period. And as you can see, very little fertilizer used in, in most of, of Africa. In contrast to the seven kilograms of nitrogen fertilizer used in Kenya, nearly 600 are used per year in the North China Plain, another 90 kilograms of phosphorus, and more nitrogen goes in from uh, human altered rainfall, from manure, from other sources. They're just extraordinarily richly, uh, rich in nitrogen. A, um, a group of agricultural biogeochemists under Dean Fuso Zhang 
at China Agricultural University recently demonstrated experimentally that it would be possible to maintain the really quite good yields that are achieved in China um, while applying about half the fertilizer that is now applied and the environmental consequences would be reduced enormously as a consequence of carefully managed inputs of about half the quantity of fertilizer that's applied now. The excess nutrients applied to these ch Chinese agricultural systems cause significant environmental and human problems, contributing to rapid soil acidification, air and water pollution, and, the, and uh, as large fractions of these applied nutrients are lost to the atmosphere, groundwater, and surface water. And, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot to see the difference between these systems. This is a maize system in western Kenya, and in contrast, a maize system in the North China Plain. And it doesn't require an advanced degree to see that one is doing better than the other. Looking into the past of the richest countries, we often see dynamics similar to China in direction, if not necessarily in magnitude. More recently, though, Europe and North America have become substantially more efficient in fertilizing crops than they were 30 or 40 years ago, or than China is now. And this is an example from the upper Midwest US, where the applications of fertilizer nitrogen versus removals in harvested crops are close to in balance. However, from an environmental perspective, these improvements are still not enough. We still have that low oxygen zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River. We still have substantial influences on downstream and downwind areas from intensive agriculture. Moreover, experience in Europe, which has taken on these challenges with policies far more seriously than has occurred in North America, show that it shows that there's a substantial lag between the implementation of policies designed to reduce environmental impacts of nutrients in agriculture and the realization of a meaningful increase in water quality. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say we have not yet demonstrated that we can maintain high-yielding intensive agricultural systems without causing substantial environmental damage. And I would say a, a large part of that challenge lies in the large-scale production of livestock rather than the uh, simple nutrient balance on crops that I've shown here. Okay, this brief discussion of the biogeochemistry of agricultural systems brings up what I think are two important points. First, that human alteration of the Earth system already is substantial and pervasive. And second, that the focus of our science has to change in response to the dominant role of human activities on the Earth. Now, climate change, global warming, is central to most public discussion of global environmental change. And it's a tremendously important issue that we can detect clearly now that will become progressively more important. However, other components of human-caused change already loom large on the Earth. Biogeochemical change is important among them. These include the direct effects of increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide on terrestrial ecosystems and on ocean acidification the massive increases in quantity of nitrogen and phosphorus in circulation and their consequences. Beyond biogeochemistry, uh, human changes in land use and land cover, this is just a, a list of some of the major changes, um, which have climatic and biogeochemical consequences of their own, represent some of the most significant human alterations of Earth to date. We've already transformed over half of the ice-free surface of Earth through our activities. And biological changes, particularly biological ex invasions and human-caused extinctions of species, are widespread, significant, and I would argue irreversible. These changes shown in this table are not things we anticipate observing in the future or the outputs of models of how the Earth must be functioning. 
They're what we can observe now. This is the level of change that has already been experienced as a result of human activity. And I think it's primarily these biogeochemical and other changes that justify Paul Crutzen's terming of the present era the Anthropocene, the geological epoch in which human influence on the functioning of the Earth system is predominant. Okay. In response to these human-caused changes, many biogeochemists and other scientists are embarked on a significant transformation in how we define our role as scientists and choose our research topics. Broadly, I think this new direction can be characterized as beginning to move from thinking in terms of a science focused on global change to a science that in part defines its role as supporting a transition to sustainability. Neither the global change nor the science for sustainability approach turns its back on understanding the fundamental mechanisms by which biogeochemical cycles, and indeed the Earth as a whole, work, nor can or should they. But I think there are some important distinctions. Under the global change approach, much of our research has been focused on diagnosis of the Earth system. We work to understand the vital signs of Earth and how they're changing. Um, and of course, the biogeochemical cycles are one of the leading indicators of that. We seek to indicate how they're being altered by human activity and what the consequences and interactions of those alterations are likely to be. This is crucially important work. Uh, it's a lot like doctors observing a patient, diagnosing the problem. And I think we've accomplished a lot. We're not yet done with it. Still, as in medicine, there's a limit to what diagnosis alone can accomplish. Much of our focus, I think, now is shifting from diagnosis to science in support of finding paths to health, paths to sustainability. I should say, by sustainability, which I think is a major challenge of 21st century research, we mean meeting the needs of people today and in the future, so with a focus on humans, while at the same time sustaining the life support systems of the planet, including the climate systems, soils, biogeochemical cycles, the millions of species and, uh, that share the planet with us and sustain us both literally and spiritually. I want to give one example of science for sustainability in the context of controlling nutrient losses from agriculture that comes from the Yaqui Valley of Mexico. This valley is the showplace of the Green Revolution for wheat, and there my partner Pamela Matson, together with Roz Naylor, who is a uh, resource economist at Stanford, and Ivan Ortiz Monasterio, an agronomist in Mexico, and others, began by evaluating nitrogen losses from intensively fertilized and irrigated fields. Fertilizer levels were high, and not surprisingly, they observed very high losses of um, nitrogen to groundwater, to the coastal ocean, where it was making a difference in the functioning of the coastal ocean, as greenhouse gases and other gases going off into the atmosphere. That's these red and blue lines in two different years here. Really substantial losses to the atmosphere from these intensive agricultural systems. <clears throat> Clearly, that was a consequence of the high levels of fertilizer that were applied, as they, as they showed unequivocally. But moving beyond diagnosis, they then developed an alternative set of fertilization practices by altering the timing at which fertilizer was applied and the quantities of fertilizer that were applied that vastly reduced the quantities of nitrogen lost to the atmosphere and downstream, and that's the green lines, illustrated here, and at the same time maintained the same yields of crops with the same grain quality. However, despite this system's ability to save money as well as spare the environment, and despite its application on farmers' fields as well as in agricultural experiment stations, new practice was not adopted widely at all. Why not? To answer that question, the research team studied the decision-making system in the valley and determined that risk-averse credit unions played a key role in determining the level 
of fertilizer applications, not the government extension agents, but these, but these credit unions. And working with the credit unions, the team was then able to develop technical means, uh, a, a sensor that determined the amount of chlorophyll in plant canopies at an early growing stage in the, in the field that um, solved the credit union's concern about making sure there was enough fertilizer on the system. And so they could assure the credit unions, as well as farmers, that sufficient fertilizer was being applied under the new system within the life of a single crop. And the lower input approach then became, became much more widely distributed in the valley. I use this illustration because I think it's one where the research could have been co considered complete and under other paradigms would have been considered complete when it documented the effects of fertilization on the fluxes of greenhouse gases and of nitrate to the surrounding or to the nearby ocean and the consequences of those fluxes and the mechanisms that control them would have been an unusually thorough study of the biogeochemistry of a region. But it became science for sustainability when agronomists, economists, and ecologists collaborated on developing an alternative fertilization scheme that maintained yields and reduced environmental consequences, as the Chinese scientists I mentioned earlier have also done. It moved even farther along the path towards sustainability when the Yaki team evaluated, understood, and influenced the knowledge system that underlies the choices made by farmers in the valley. So I think that that's a pathway that calls to us fairly substantially, not just documenting our effect, not just diagnosing systems, but developing an understanding of uh, blazing a path towards a more sustainable use of resources, a more sustainable set of production practices that have much less impact on our environment. Now, in closing, I want to return briefly to where I started, to Hawaii and to the other islands of the Pacific Ocean. There I want to ask a little bit different question. Whether the histories and cultures of the Pacific can contribute something meaningful to our understanding of sustainability. The Polynesian people who discovered and colonized many of the islands of the central and southern Pacific were remarkable explorers. They journeyed thousands of kilometers on deliberate voyages of exploration and settlement between 1,000 and 3,000 years ago. As a result of their activities, they established societies on widely scattered archipelagos across the Pacific that um, <coughs> covered the lar much of the largest ocean on the planet. The islands they discovered are diverse, ranging in climate from temperate to tropical and from small coral atolls to rich volcanic high islands to the subcontinental mass of New Zealand. Necessarily, these people adjusted their agriculture and social systems to the resources they found on each of the islands and they colonized. And consequently, their societies along, evolved along different paths on their very different islands. Another important point about these islands, I think, is that in the centuries before their, their um, rediscovery and colonization by Europeans and their um, subsequent incorporation into the global economic system, these islands were worlds in a very real sense. Their people were absolutely dependent on local resources, and they lived in re relative isolation, more isolation than people on continents anywhere, or continental margins anywhere, could have conceived of. In their island worlds, they intensified their production pathways by mul in multiple ways that were tuned to the very diverse uh, and distinct environments where they found themselves. This is an irrigated system in Hawaii. This is the remains of a dryland agricultural system in Hawaii. And in these areas, they developed complex, highly structured and densely populated societies on many islands. Now, as they developed, there's clear evidence that Polynesian societies used 
resources exploitatively, as human societies do. They and the plants and animals that they brought with them in their canoes drove many local species to extinction. They cleared forests and otherwise altered land use as they developed their intensive systems. And they redistributed resources in ways that altered the local biogeochemical cycles. As their populations grew and their island's resources were depleted, they had the advantage of being able to see it. They could see that what was on their, their island was all there was. And they faced the challenge of global change to their island world and faced the need for a transition to living more sustainably. I think evidence is again clear that some of their societies made transitions from exploitative to explicitly sustainable social and production systems. Others failed to adjust and suffered some substantial environmental degradation and social collapse as a consequence. And I think still others combined elements of uh, transition towards sustainability with innovation, uh, expanding their production base with new systems and technologies, continuing to grow, and had not yet faced any final Malthusian reckoning by the time of European contact. So my interest is, what can be learned about sustainability from studying islands where cultures made or failed to make transitions in the past. As we know now, well enough, Earth as a whole is an island too, and not a very large one in the ocean of space. The pervasive nature of global change in the biogeochemical cycles, land use, and other features shows that we are coming up against Earth's limits, at least in our current way of doing things, and finding newer and more sustainable ways of living will require the best of our science and technology. However, I think in addition to science and technology and to economics and to politics, my limited understanding of island societies suggests that we need to pay more attention to the importance of culture as a factor <clears throat> in sustainability. Science and technology are essential, potentially transformative, but our culture and belief systems provide much of the motivation to develop and apply science and technology, economics and policy towards making a transition to sustainability. I'm not suggesting that we can or should adopt island agricultural or social practices. Of course, relatively few of the particular practices invented by Tikopians or Hawaiians or Maori are likely to be directly useful to modern society. However, I think that there are things in their ways of thinking about the world which were shaped by generations of experience when their island was the world could be very important. And I think it's particularly relevant that Polynesian culture today is undergoing a Pacific-wide renaissance, driven in part by the rejuvenation of long-distance canoe voyaging led by Nainoa Thompson and others. That re uh, renaissance includes many features from political rights to language, but it also, uh, some island leaders and young people are working to articulate their visions of sustainability. In doing so, they are looking neither exclusively towards what was a great past, nor towards uh, assimilation into the worldview of modern science and economics and the global system, but rather towards navigating on a path that draws on the best of both. And I think that that's an important effort that probably has a great deal to teach us as we think about navigating our path towards a more sustainable future. Finally, I just want to say briefly that, as I'm sure you appreciate, I know very little of Japan and Japanese society, but enough to be very clear, as you know, this is an island society as well, an island culture, and one that has navigated a unique cultural, economic, and scientific and technical path. And I think individually and collectively, scientists and citizen, you may have more to contribute to the global transition to sustainability than almost any other group of people in the world. Thank you.